The following video may contain sensitive topics. The views and opinions of the presenter to these are plainly his own. Furthermore, any and all views and opinions of the presenter do not in any way reflect the views, opinions, statements, and advocacies of his personal contacts, his family, his affiliations, and his profession. While the presenter makes a commitment that all content is original, he is obliged to cite references or acknowledge resources mentioned or used in the production of this video. This disclaimer is also written in the description below. You wanna hear some initial thoughts? It sounds like tutti frutti. <laughs> ano ba naisip ko? At bakit katunog siya ng tutti frutti? Bakit? A few moments later. And it makes me reflect on what transpired a year ago. You know what? Screw it! On the 3rd of October, the Pope has issued his third encyclical. And you know, it makes me reflect on what transpired a year ago. Now, a quick disclaimer before the intro. I am not someone with authority to interpret the following document as in an official role. I am also not a seminarian or an ex-seminarian to even deal with this matter. I am just a small-time YouTuber who happens to be a Catholic and is curious about the content of this document. That's the reason why I wanted to do this review. Okay, so with, with that out of the way, let's get on with the show. Hi there, Ian here. This is going to be a bit comprehensive, a review episode, and I might have to either split this review into two videos or have a very long video still in two parts. So either way, it's one damn long document that I would never tackle all of it in one sitting. Now, in order for you to have some context, why am I triggered to do this video? Let me take you back from last year. We all know that in Catholic circles, online and offline, the Pachamama incident has split us all. And my own circle of friends, acquaintances, and contacts have not been spared. Until now, the emotional scar uh, this left within me still bleeds and the two factions of my group have still not reconciled with each other or so I think and of course there's also the occasional case of the snake in the grass who ruined it all so to make the long story short I guess what made me do this very poor attempt to abbreviate Fratelli Tutti the name of the document is that is the fact that I am still very much pissed off by that bloody Pachamama debacle that some say became the harbinger of the COVID-19 pandemic. And before I begin, let me tell you something. If you're watching this and you're liking what you're seeing in my, in my YouTube channel, please do me a favor. On the bottom right corner near the screen, there is a big red subscribe button there. Click it and make it gray and then ring, ring the notification bell by selecting all. Also, I would appreciate it if you share this video and my channel to everyone you know who wants to subscribe to a quality commentary-based Filipino YouTuber based in the Philippines who is fighting the good fight against the trends of the mighty algorithm. With that said, let's begin. The encyclical's title comes from the admonitions of St. Francis of Assisi the founder of the illustrious and seraphic order of Friars Minor or the OFM community, as well as the namesake of the current Pope's regal name. The Pope has published this encyclical on the eve of the Feast of St. Francis with him offering Mass and sing signing rather, the encyclical on the seraphic father's tomb in Assisi. Fratelli Tutti in Italian literally means brethren all, implying that all are called to fraternal love as God himself admonishes us to love one another as he did to us in his life on earth. In Tagalog, Fratelli Tutti means ang lahat ay magkakapatid. With these words, the Pope writes this encyclical with this inspiration in mind. Francis felt himself a brother to the sun, the sea, and the wind, yet he knew that he was even closer to those of his, his own flesh. 
Wherever he went, he sowed seeds of peace and walked alongside the poor, the abandoned, the infirm, and the outcast, the least of his brothers and sisters. Now in the eight years of the Bergolian papacy, there have been naysayers in what he would like the church to be, of course by the grace of God. And though we cannot blame the Pope for this neutered language and demeanor not fitting of his office, we also cannot blame the triumphalistic mindset of Taylor Marshall, Archbishop Cardo Maria Vigano, Bishop Athanasius Schneider. I don't know why, but it sounds German to me. And Cardinal Joseph Zen for calling out the Pope and his complacency when it comes to the promotion of the good of the church as front and center of his policies. Now, before you say anything, let me put on record that I am no admirer of a majority of the Pope's policies, especially among persecuted Christians in China. But that doesn't mean I'd go full Taylor Marshall and call Fratelli Tutti another bundle of blabber inscribed as an encyclical, or whatever, whatever he wants to call it, as it has its good points. Remember, mga kababayan, a faithful Christian, a faithful Catholic, is someone who is both merciful and meritocratic. So I say, issues like these deserve another video for another time. Or is it? Let me know in the comments below. The encyclical begins by telling the context of the story of St. Francis in his travels to the Holy Land to aid the Crusaders. He also expressed the scope and limitations of the document, citing that the following pages do not claim to offer a complete teaching on fraternal love but rather to consider its universal scope, its openness to every man and woman. And if the Pope is having a hard time uh, teaching all this to every Catholic, we shouldn't also beat ourselves down and try to enter, either promote it or destroy it. But at least, we must do our best. That's my, uh, that's my take on it. Now, being the first papal document issued during a modern pandemic, it is His Holiness's hope that we see and rediscover the ideas of fraternity and fraternal love. He writes, For all our hyper-connectivity, we witnessed a fragmentation that made it more difficult to resolve problems that affect us all. Anyone who thinks that the only lesson to be learned was the need to improve what we, are, what we were already doing or to refine existing systems and regulations is denying reality. It is my desire, he continues, that in this our time, by acknowledging the dignity of each human person, we can contribute to the rebirth of a universal aspiration to fraternity. The first chapter of the document gives some context as to why the Pope was urged to write this, the, the encyclical in the first place, considering certain global trends that hinder the development of universal fraternity, or so His Holiness calls it such. One such trend is the culture of opening, opening up to the world, not only in terms of economy and investments, but also in adapting the said culture to, the ex to exploit the local conflicts and the disregard for the common good. This culture unifies the world but divides persons and nations, the Pope says, in reference to his predecessor, Benedict XVI's ex encyclical, Caritas in Veritate. For a society is becomes ever more globalized, it makes us neighbors but does not make us brothers. Because of this globalization and the realization of the McLuhanist global village, history is no longer being considered a good, a good context in how the world should tackle with the everyday woes of people that makes people resort to some starting from scratch and eventually drive man to limitless consumption and expressions of em empty individualism. The Pope also reminds all men of goodwill that it is not Thomistic theology or rocket science to consider avoiding the throwaway culture His Holiness pointed out in Laudato Si. Specifically, the throwing away of, away of people who are no longer productive economically or even considered as a burden to society. Because of this culture of utilitarianism, the Pope seems to think that there is a growing loss of the sense of history, which leads to further breakup, a kind of 
deconstructionism whereby human freedom claims to create everything starting from zero is making headway in today's culture. With it also comes the culture of quashing all kinds of opposition and any cult reference to history and historical consciousness, thus paving away the way to for new forms of cultural colonization, aka colonial mentality. Through emptying of key terms, ideas, and values, and or the manip manipulation of such. Then there's also the misguided idea of throwing away what seems to be the most vulnerable persons of every society. That is to say, the, um, the unborn who some consider as parasites to women who unfortunately bear them, and the elderly, who are now basically just people waiting for their inevitable end. The young, able, and productive, some say, are the only ones entitled to an opinion and should be heard in society. Adding to that heap of things being thrown out of the window is the idea of an equitable life in accordance to how laborers and fellow humans in general are treated. No wonder there is a connection between the throwing away of the unborn and the throwing away of one's life because they never asked to be born and yet they exist and wanted to just take the easy way out through suicide. But before I go on, I, the reason why I review this document is for me to realize and for me to help people realize that all of us matter to each other. So please know that you are not alone. And when there is disregard in parts of society, then there's misunderstanding and deliberate disgust. There's also war and persecution. It is a no-brainer that wars stem from mutual disgust and indifference. And as mentioned earlier, I find this papacy's actions in rescuing persecuted Christians as a sham as the church slowly kowtows to the will of the Chinese Communist Party who basically imposes their kind of Christianity that would comply with Maoist communism. So much for the religion of the Lord of Heaven. Now that we are currently in the midst of a global pandemic, it seems that we have been forced to go back to square one, all of us. And we may still have to progress through the learning curve as to doing things at home, working, studying, learning new skills, and so on. And even introverts and ambiverts who are supposed to be used to all this pre-pandemic are also finding it hard to do so. And thus, we also resort to doing crazy and utterly stupid things such as pranks and useless challenges to kill the time we all have at home instead of being productive. Siguro dami na rin natin yung, ano, yung gaming, ano, gaming industry. But hey, a lot of gamers are uh, earning because they stream uh, themselves playing games. So uh, I think that's out of the question. <laughs> And this us versus them thinking is just being exacerbated by the fact that we live in a very technologically advanced world as one of its major setbacks. There is a part early on in the encyclical which is subtitled The Illusion of Communication. Now as a once communication scholar and currently an independent communications practitioner, I can agree with His Holiness's commentaries about the repercussion of a technologically advanced world where privacy is slowly being encroached whether or not one intends to reveal his private life on social media. Digital communication, the Pope writes, wants to bring everything out into the open. People's lives are combed over, laid bare, and bandied about, often anonymously. Moreover, he continues, respect for others disintegrates. And even as we dismiss, ignore, or keep others distant, we can shamelessly peer into every detail of their lives. And that is the problem. While technology is a force for good if utilized for the common good, it may also be used for wicked and evil intentions. Aggression is on the rise because social media gives people who were once deprived of the means to make their sentiments and frustrations known a platform to air them out in the open. Information, while important in the quest for better understanding of the world and our surroundings, as well as to gain knowledge when it comes to certain aspects of our personal and professional life, becomes isolated in the quest for the deeper meaning of life. Wisdom is relegated as a corner site furniture 
and empathy is thrown out of the window altogether. Debates no longer result in deeper appreciation to one's personal thinking but in deeper animosity and even hatred for the opponent in the marketplace. Even dialogues no longer exist. All that there is are but monologues of their own viewpoints without engaging in healthy discussion. The second chapter of the encyclical takes its context for the parable of the Good Samaritan and other stories from the, from the Bible, such as that of Cain and Abel and that of Job. But what seems to be the tradition of fraternity we mainly cite in the Bible are also the same ones we share with the Jews as many of the references on the subject of charity and fraternity comes from the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. And from here, Christians also are admonished by Christ first and foremost to love our neighbor as ourselves and to do good to the least of his brethren. Basically, the Pope exhorts all men of goodwill to answer the proverbial question, who is my neighbor. The third chapter focuses on the proposal of opening one's arms to his brother in need. One example the Pope shared is his is the monastic tradition of the sacred duty of hospitality of all Benedictine orders. We all know all Benedictines and all those who follow the rule of Saint Benedict shut themselves from this world to focus on the life in the next. And yet, as pilgrims visit their monasteries, they provide as well for their needs. No wonder the tradition of creating various products through the labors of their hands, as well as the purchase and use of such, has become an important part of every monk's duty and every order's signature identity. For example, um, sorry, mag off script ako ng hotdays. For example, some, uh, some monastic orders have created beer. Some monastic orders create have created some uh, have created wine, uh, not only for uh, secular consumption but also uh, mass wine. Uh, Benedictine nuns and other uh, monastic uh, religious orders have also uh, produced uh, produced the bread for communion, and uh, there are also dairy products. The produce of the land, uh, meats and yam, yung mga ano pa eh, yung mga sustenance pa na uh, mga meats and all that, uh, depende sa ano, depende sa resources na meron yung mga uh, Benedictino or yung mga sumusunod sa rule, uh, rule of Saint Benedict. So, uh, for example, dito sa Pilipinas, yung mga Trappist monks sa Gimaras, uh, gumagawa sila ng mga ano, ng mga mango products or uh, mga pastries out of mango and all that so and uh, somehow it you know, it supplements their income and uh, basically uh, helps with the upkeep of their uh, of their monastery so yun uh, yun lang naman yung ano ko dun, yung maliit na example ko dun. so let's get back to the script social friendship is the term the Pope used to indicate a love capable of transcending borders in the context of cities and countries. Only through this social friendship would universal openness be possible. This contrasts the false idea of universalism of those who constantly travel abroad because they cannot tolerate the love of their own people. In our context, this absolutely applies to everyone in the Filipino diaspora. It is true that people leave our islands to seek greener pastures and to our shame because of the apparent smart shaming of our countrymen. But in return, it is no license for the Filipino expatriate to entitle himself and treat his fellow countrymen like a piece of turd. Fraternity then defines equality and liberty. Fraternity is openness to the act of charity. The Pope goes on to share his point about fraternity in the context of the promotion of the human being, the moral good, human dignity, and its rights, and so on. The fourth chapter tackles on the issue of immigration, a topic very close to the heart of the Pope as his ancestors were Italian immigrants who took, who took their chance of living their lives in Buenos Aires. 
as well as the concepts of a fruitful exchange of cultures and assistance and also the importance of being grateful to others by starting them all with ourselves. The fifth chapter talks about how charity, fraternity, and social friendship should apply in politics. As this is a can of worms into itself, I would rather skip tackling about this matter altogether and let the other punters have a go. But the bottom line of that chapter is that it is indeed a delicate balance between upholding one's political principles and the call to political charity and fraternity. So again, I let them I let them uh, tackle that one. No thank you. The encyclical has eight chapters and what I admire about His Holiness's style is that the dullest part is something he placed in the middle. No wonder you have me just enumerating the various talk points of the encyclical in those parts. That means there are still three chapters remaining in this view. Three chapters. And uh, boy, I would like to tackle them and give my personal take on this matter in the next video. So with all that said... This is Ian reminding you that at all times, be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Until then, look alive, stay alive, and stay tuned for part two of this review. See you next time. Ian out.